Now, moving on to our final plenary speech of the day, it's a great pleasure to introduce Nuria Oliver, the co-founder and vice president of ELIS, the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligent Systems. Nuria Oliver is also the commissioner to the president of the Valencian government on artificial intelligence strategy and data science against COVID-19 and chief data scientist at Datapop Alliance. Nuria earned her PhD from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and is a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and Academia Europea. Amongst many other awards, she was named Data Scientist of the Year 2020 by ESRI. She recently co-led Valencia A4 COVID, and that is the team that won a $500,000 XPRIZE Pandemic Response Challenge Award. And this is exactly what Nuria will talk about now, how they used open data in the fight against COVID-19 since March 2020. Nuria, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And thank you very much for your kind uh, presentation. So in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'm going to describe the work that we have done in the Valencian region during the pandemic on using uh, data and AI to help the government make better decisions. This is joint a joint effort. Um, that involves uh, most of the universities and uh, a couple of research centers in the Valencian region of Spain, which, as you see on the map, or, or I'm telling you, is on the east uh, uh, of Spain on the Mediterranean coast. Um, the main purpose for and the main goal for this work is to fill the gap that there is between where the data is understanding that the data is a digital representation of an underlying reality and where the decision makers are. And if we want their decisions to be informed by evidence, and we believe that data is a digital representation of the underlying evidence, then what we need to do is to fill this gap. And in the context of the pandemic, since March of 2020, we have been working on four large areas that are trying to fill some uh, elements of this gap. The first area is uh, mobile data analysis. So analyzing large scale human mobility, given that an infectious disease that is transmitted from human to human, like coronavirus, doesn't become a pandemic if people don't move. And that's why we have been confined for so many months and that's why understanding human mobility is so important. The second large area is what is called computational epidemiological models, models that would enable us to predict the number of cases in the future under the current situation, but also under different potential scenarios of confinement measures. The third area is the development of predictive models, particularly of hospital occupancy, intensive care occupancy, and also a model to infer the prevalence of the disease and the last area is a very large scale citizen science project through a survey called the COVID-19 impact survey, which has over 700,000 answers right now and is one of the largest uh, citizen surveys in the world about COVID-19. There is still a gap between where the output of all these um, uh, work streams is and where the decision makers are. And I think one of the key elements for the success of our work is this layer, this sort of like uh, uh, brown layer of uh, results aggregation and interpretation, which has been mainly um, fulfilled by uh, me in collaboration with a director general working for the president of the government. So a key take home message from this effort is the need to have multidisciplinary, multi-institutional teams where um, the actual decision makers are part of the team. So they make an effort in understanding the technical work, but also in translating it to political language and also in helping define the priorities. We had a, a, a different uh, expertises in the team, uh, most of them within computer science uh, and mathematics, but you know there were some components also of uh, uh, visualization in some of the areas. And we've been working 
for many, many months, uh, very intensely having daily meetings and I, I was writing reports every day and we have a common repository for code. We have a very active Slack channel and obviously everyone has signed the necessary code of ethics and um, NDAs and collaboration agreements to be able to work together. This is an example of one uh, meeting one day uh, during the pandemic. And we do have a website on the government's website, but it's in Spanish, so I'm not sure uh, how relevant it would be. So unfortunately, it is not um, easy to create such a team, and there aren't that many examples like our example. And some of the challenges are, are around the lack of capacity and digital mindsets in the public administrations. There is also difficulties around the accessing of the data. There are obviously concerns about privacy and data protection, but I wanted to highlight that everything that I'm going to tell today has been done using uh, publicly available uh, aggregated data. There is also a gap between where research ends and where the operational projects sort of start and filling that gap is not always easy. And then, of course, when you when you have a pandemic where it's just something unexpected and you have to make decisions every day, you know, very quickly, if you don't have all the other elements already in place, it's probably very difficult to be able to leverage data to support the decision making. So what have we done? So I'm going to go very quickly to some of the results and the work that we have done in each of the areas. For mobile data analysis, uh, as I mentioned, the key main objective was to uh, quantify large scale human mobility. And we uh, were declared the pilot region in Spain during the first wave of COVID-19 to be able to use large scale mobile data that was shared with us by the National Office of Statistics, which in turn um, computed the data from uh, data provided by the three largest telcos in Spain in a, a pilot project that had started um, a, a couple of years before the pandemic. This is an example of the visualization of the mobility data that, um, uh, that we analyzed. And um, this data um, is aggregated, obviously, to preserve privacy. And the geographic aggregation is represented on this slide. So each of these uh, irregularly shaped regions is the minimum uh, spatial granularity that we had the data for. It had to have at least 5,000 people living in them. And uh, if a municipality had less than 5,000 people, then it would bring together multiple municipalities. And that's why some of the areas are very large. And if a municipality was between 5,000 and 70,000 people, there would be one area for that municipality. And then for larger municipalities, the municipality would be split in different areas. And for each of these different um, areas, we had information about the incoming and the outgoing flows of people every day. Using that information, we could determine, for example, how successful the stay-at-home campaign was. And we found that, on average, 80% of the population in working days and 92 of the population during weekends uh, did not leave their area of residence for more than uh, two hours during the first wave of the pandemic. We have been doing the mobility analysis since then, um, even though the first wave was the one that um, had the biggest lockdown uh, in Spain and probably one of the strongest lockdowns in Europe. Other findings, we found a significant reduction in the radius of gyration, which is uh, the radius of the circumference that contains most of the movements of a population. And that reduction in the Valencian region was a 65% which was larger than the average of Spain. And this means that if before the pandemic, the, the average radius was 10 kilometers in a day, because of the confinement, it went down to 3.5 kilometers. We also analyzed the uh, labor mobility, and we did find very significant reductions in labor mobility, and also on the activity levels, which are the incoming and the outgoing flows. So the conclusion was there was a very significant impact on, uh, uh, on mobility because of the uh, confinement measures. Uh, understanding how important it is to communicate all these results to uh, non-expert audiences, we developed a uh, visualization portal that um, uh, anyone can use, including the policymakers, where they can click on the different regions and look at the incoming flows and the outgoing flows and the levels of activity over uh, a, a, a varying time period that they can determine uh, which period it is. 
because we have um, incoming and outgoing flows, we can uh, run a community detection algorithm and identify uh, what we call mobility communities. And these are uh, regions that have a lot of uh, in inside mobility within the region, but don't have a lot of mobility to other regions. Um, doing this uh, analysis, we identified for the Valencian region uh, 14 um, mobility communities, which are important, particularly if the policymakers want to do partial confinements and they want to understand what would be the impact of doing a partial confinement in a certain uh, region within the uh, Valencian uh, community. The second um, line of work has been on developing computational epidemiological models, models that would enable us to um, uh, determine how many people would be infected under different uh, scenarios, and also to determine whether the social contention measures would be enough or not. The first kind of model that we have developed is a, a traditional uh, SAIR compartmental metapopulation model. This model divides the population into four different states. That's why it's called compartmental. They are divided in compartments. And because initially everyone is susceptible to COVID-19, everyone uh, starts in the susceptible state. And then with a certain probability beta, people get exposed to the virus. Then with another probability, people get infectious and infected. And then with another probability, people get recovered or retire from the system if they uh, die. Um, this model is, uh, is very well studied, is very well used, and this is the different differential equations that determine the dynamics of the model. And the parameters have already been estimated for COVID-19, and we adjusted them to the Valencian region. We also added mobility to this model because we had the mobility information, and we have been running predictions using this model every day on the number of cases and the number of active cases. We also developed an agent-based epidemiological model. In this case, um, instead of um, uh, classifying the population into four different states as a compartment, we model each person. So we have 5 million agents. There are 5 million people in the region. And then each of these people have, is each of these agents have an age, and it has a gender, and it has a contact matrix. And then uh, there is an underlying SAIR model in this um, agent-based model that determines the different states that people can be in, uh, in terms of the disease. And then you can run simulations with the model. And we've been also doing predictions of we are using this model on the number of cases, number of active cases, number of hospitalizations, and number of um, uh, diseased. And finally, in the context of the XPRIZE Pandemic Response Challenge, we decided to uh, build um, another model, which was, um, a deep neural network based model using um, LSTMs, which is a kind of the current neural network. And uh, in this architecture, we model on, on the top, we have a bank of models that model the number of cases in the world. For this challenge, we had to build a system that would predict the number of COVID-19 cases in 236 countries and regions in the world. So it was a lot more than just the Valencian region. And then the bottom layer models the interventions. So the different non-pharmaceutical interventions, the different confinement measures that are implemented in each of these countries and regions in such a way that our model not only uh, takes into consideration how many cases there are and they have been, but also which uh, measures are implemented in each region. Our model performed uh, really well during the competition. It had the third best mean run globally, the first in the European countries and the Asian countries. But more importantly, we were able to use it during the uh, third wave of infections in the Valencian region of Spain, which took place in uh, January of 2021, and which was the worst wave. And here I show the ground truth in yellow and in blue, the predictions from this model and in red, the predictions from a state of the art uh, model. So we can see that our model was a lot more accurate in predicting the peak of the infection uh, in terms of the day and also the number of cases. And then uh, within the context of the competition, we added a new layer in our architecture, which is this pink layer, which is a recommender of interventions. So like an artificial politician, a system that would try to identify the best policies giving a certain country with a certain epidemiological situation and also given a cost for the different policies that could be applied. 
and we uh, developed the um, automatic system to do that and also a visualization where you could click a country and then the system will recommend you up to 10 different policies that had the best trade-off between the cost of the policy and the number of cases that would result if you were to apply such a policy and the policy could be the combination of 12 different kinds of measures from closing schools closing the borders not allowing uh, gatherings you know and so forth and as, as it was mentioned in the introduction, we were the winners of this XPLIS competition. We've also been doing uh, extensions on our models to understand the impact of contact tracing, for example, where we found that even if you trace 40 to 50% of the contacts, you can really flatten the curve, assuming everyone can self-isolate. And lately, since the summer, we've been doing a lot of work on the impact of vaccination and adding vaccination in our models. The third line of work is in building predictive models, and we have mostly focused on building models to predict the, the hospital occupancy and the intensive care occupancy, because these are um, some of the two most important variables for public policy decision making. And then finally, we have launched this really large scale citizen survey because there were many questions about people's situations during the pandemic that we couldn't respond because we didn't have any data for them. For example, you know, what is the social contact behavior of people? What is the economic and labor impact of the pandemic? What is the prevalence of symptoms? What is the emotional impact? What are individual protection measures people take? You know, is contact tracing working? So there were so many questions that we couldn't answer. So we decided to collect the data ourselves. We launched this survey called COVID-19 Impact Survey. It's completely anonymous. It has 26 questions. It's been translated to many languages. We launched it on March 28th, uh, 2020 and we got over 700,000 answers so far. And I, I recommend you uh, uh, to um, respond to it, uh, uh, you know, if, if, you are, well, if you want to volunteer with your answers. Uh, we got such a strong re response in March 2020 that we very quickly published this paper in JMIR where we shared the data from the first week of data collection and also some of the key insights that we uh, found uh, at the time and that have been applying to, for the rest of the pandemic. We built two different visualization tools. This is the most recent one using Tableau. It's, uh, it's updated every week, so you can look at it and check out the latest data from the survey. Uh, we also have a few papers that describe some of the main insights of different questions and different aspects of the survey, but I wanted to share with you some of them today. So the first one is the emotional impact of the pandemic. And I wanted to contrast in some of the answers, the answers from Spain and the answers from Germany, because they are very different countries in the, uh, in the behaviors and the answers from people. So what we know since March of 2020 is that the most impacted demographic group are young women. Women are marked in red and men are marked in blue. And particularly, uh, young women aged 18 to 29 are the ones that report the highest levels of stress, the highest levels of anxiety, the highest levels of sadness, but even the highest levels of loneliness. It is the young people, not the old people, because of the pandemic. So one of our main recommendations has been developing uh, youth programs to support the mental health of the youth. When we look at the perception of the government measures, and this is the perception since March of 2020 for the entire pandemic, this is what people think about the government measures. And the options are the measures are too much, too more, they are enough, I prefer not to answer or I do not know. And as you can see in Spain for the entire pandemic, the most popular answer was do more until very recently when the most popular answer was uh, the measures are enough. And however, as the cases are starting to increase, in the past couple of weeks, the most popular answer is again that the government should do more to contain the pandemic. When we look at Germany, we have a very different profile where generally until roughly um, the summer of, so like the fall of 2020, the most popular answer was uh, do more. And then they were pretty equal. And as you can see here, there is a massive uh, demand for more measures as the number of cases have been uh, growing exponentially in Germany. When we look at which protection measures people adopt, 
uh, we can see that the first observation is that women are much more compliant than men. Women are in red and men are in blue. And this is the percentage of people that report disinfecting hands, wearing face masks, avoiding crowds and so forth. And you can see that how women are a lot more compliant than men. Another important finding is the very high uh, willingness to get vaccinated in Spain, where for many, 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 many months, it has been higher than 90%. Now it has gone down a little bit, mainly because most of the population, 90% of the population is vaccinated, but it's a very, very high intention to get vaccinated. When we compare the data with German data, we find, first of all, that the compliance with the measures is very low in Germany compared to Spain. We find that women are a lot more compliant than men, and we find a very low intention to get vaccinated in Germany when compared to Spain, where we have only uh, around 54% of the people saying that they're willing to get vaccinated, which is really low. This is a map that shows the differences in the intention to get vaccinated in the different regions in Spain, Italy, and Germany. And you can see how uh, uh, varying that intention is. When we look at the perception of different activities over time, there isn't anything super significant here. Uh, except that doing a sports individually is always considered to be the safest activity in terms of risk of getting COVID-19. And then uh, the least safe activity is always considered flying by plane. This is data for Spain. And then in Germany, the, the ranking, the ordering is similar, but the perception is lower for a lot of the activities, but then flying by plane has a, a higher perception of safety than in Spain, for example. Another important uh, issue is whether people are able to self-isolate. We want to contain the pandemic. We need to make sure that every positive case has the ability to self-isolate. And we know since the beginning of the pandemic that roughly 50% of the people 59 and younger are unable to self-isolate, mainly because of sharing the home. But we do find a very significant difference in the psychological reasons among the youth, people age uh, 18 to 29 are, are significantly more likely to report that they are not able to self-isolate because of psychological reasons. And we also find a significant gender difference in the women aged 30 to 59 in their inability to self-isolate because having to take care of children when compared to men, where 29%, 28% of the women, but only 13% of the men report that they wouldn't be able to self-isolate because of taking care of children in this demographic group, in this age group 30 to 59. When we look at Germany, we have uh, similar results of the youth being the most impacted psychologically, and we have a very significant uh, uh, difference in the uh, women versus men aged 30 to 59 in the reasons of not being able to self-isolate because of having to take care of children as well, where almost half of the women say that they wouldn't to be able to self-isolate because of having to take care of children. And finally, we also have data about contact tracing, the contact tracing app. And so far, according to our data, the impact of the app has been very minimal. From a sample of 139,000 people, roughly 30% report having the app, of which 7.7% report having had a close contact with an, ind an infected individual. So at least a third of those should be susceptible for receiving a notification from the app, but only 86 of them reported receiving a notification of which only 27 reporting getting a test of which only seven people tested positive. So it's a very small impact and something similar happens in Germany. We have a slightly higher impact in Germany, but it's still around 1% of the impact. So what have I learned during all these months and with all this work? So I have learned, first of all, the obvious, which is a pandemic is not just a public health issue. It's a societal issue which requires a multidisciplinary holistic approach. I have also learned that we have the opportunity to create a virtuous cycle between these three elements, and we are not there yet. We haven't been able to do that. First of all, data, data that will be captured systematically and analyzed systematically to understand where we are, why we are where we are, but also predict where we might be going. The second pillar is people empowered with technology, the right uh, human resources, but also empowered with the right technology. 
And of course, you know, we use the data and, and we leverage all this knowledge and all these people and all this talent to inform public policy making. So the policies respond to potential gaps and areas for improvement in an underlying reality. For example, if we know that the youth is the most impacted group psychologically, you know, they, it might be interesting to deploy programs to support the youth, you know, under mental health. We actually wrote a, a policy paper that I don't have the time to present here uh, together with Data Pop Alliance and the Vodafone Institute is publicly available. I recommend you to look at it if you want to know more about this. We also have a lot of scientific publications and we have also been appearing in the media, in Politico, in MSNBC and Wire wrote a long article about us a couple of months ago that tells our story and you might also be interested in reading. So. This is it. Uh, thank you very much. And again, um, if you uh, would like to respond to the survey, we'll welcome your answers. Thank you. Nuria, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation and congratulations to all of the incredible hard work that you've clearly done with your team. A couple of questions. I know we have to move on to Pascal, who's a very busy man, but I'm going to squeeze in a couple of questions for you first of all. First question, anonymous. What is available as open data? Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, most of the data that we analyze is publicly uh, available data. So we used uh, for all the cases data, we use the uh, very nice initiative that in Oxford, uh, which is the Oxford uh, COVID-19 tracker, I think is the name that has the number of cases and diseased and all the interventions implemented in every country. The, uh, the survey data is also at least part of it publicly available and the visualizations are all publicly available. Um, so the mobility data is actually publicly available. So the Spanish National Office of Statistics published the data uh, in the summer of 2020. So even though initially it wasn't publicly available, then it was made publicly available as well. So uh, most of the data is actually publicly available. Thank you so much, Nuri. And one final question to you from Martina. She thanks you for your wonderful presentation and asks, why are the epidemiological models not under the predictive models umbrella? For instance, can the neural network you developed be used to also make predictions? Yeah, so that's what we use to predict the hospital occupancy. <laughs> yeah, so the, the predictive models are using um, a part of them, we use different techniques and um, some of them were using uh, recurrent neural networks. So particularly LSTMs to predict the hospital occupancy and the intensive care occupancy, both for COVID-19 patients and in general, but we also use other methods. We don't include them as computational epidemiological models because they are not taking into account the, um, the state that people can be in, in terms of um, um, exposed, uh, infected, and so forth. They are just a time series uh, prediction model that takes into account the, the, the current number of cases, the capacity in the hospitals, and then predicts you know, the occupancy um, in, the, in the hospitals. But yes, there are, um, so the, um, the deep learning based model that we use during the XPRIZE competition and the predictive models that we use to predict, or some of them that we use to predict hospital occupancy are uh, very similar. But we also developed computational epidemiological models that were more traditional, so to say, epidemiological models like the SAIR uh, compartmental model and the agent-based model. Nuria, thank you so much. It was really an absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, yes, another person has said, awesome work and presentation. Do you have plans to open source the code and make the models learned available at some point? Yeah, we do have them on GitHub. I actually, I think they are already available. Uh, if you read our paper, we had we won Best Paper Award in the uh, Applied Data Science track at ECML PKDD this year. The paper was presented in, in September. Um, actually, um, um, here, this paper, this, oh, sorry, this paper, and we, um, um, I'm pretty sure, if not, please email me, but I, I am pretty sure that we put a link to our GitHub server with the code, so the code is available as well. 
Yes, and I know that the people online couldn't see that paper, but I'm sure they can get in touch with you, the, the anonymous person. Oh, sorry. Who won <laughs> sorry. No, 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 no problem. Uh, I'm sure the person can get in touch with you. Uh, but I think everybody from the messages I can see have thoroughly enjoyed your talk. And it was really fascinating to see the comparisons as well with different countries and how so many people of different age groups, denominations, genders, etc., have suffered or not suffered, uh, a colleague walking behind you. Then. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 it's lovely, this this hybrid event, uh, the naturalness of it all. Thank you so much. I uh, hope you get time to relax as well, and good luck with your continued work and expertise. Thank you. Thank you very much, and congratulations also on the organization of the conference. Thank you, Nuri.